Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of I Remember Game. Now, in my last episode, I told some stories through parody about my experiences with the Sega Saturn and specifically with a video game called D. This time, I want to go into just a little bit more detail of the background on how this game was able to come to market with as much objectionable material as it had. I also want to go over some things about the Sega Saturn itself. So let's strap right in and let's get into our next episode covering the Sega Saturn. And that's about the time she walked away from me. Nobody likes you when you're 23. And I saw more of these my TV shows. What the hell is ADD? My friends say I should act my age. What's my age again? What's my age again? Now, right off the bat, let's talk about the elephant in the room, D. This was the focus of my last episode, and I've had a lot of requests wanting to know a little bit more about it. D, the teen-rated game that included copious amounts of on-screen gore, on-screen death, stabbing, murder, and ending everything up with some matriarch, 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 motherly, eating your mom, if I may. So, how did this happen? How did a game come out with scenes really, at this point, 1995, never before depicted on a home console? How did it slip by the censors, and how did it get by them with just a T rating? The story of how this happened is actually the story of a man. A man named Kenji Ino from Japan. Who is Kenji, you ask? Well, this is the man behind the company Warp that put out the games D, Enemy Zero, and D2, as well as some other really interesting games in Japan. He was called a maverick, a rebel. 1UP.com called him Japan's wayward son. Whatever he was, he was an outsider, and he wanted to keep it that way. He made it a point. Kenji loved video games. From a young age, he was quoted at saying, the first time that he saw Space Invaders was like the first time that he felt, you know, that feeling you get when you see a woman. It was like being in love. He was able to go to a school for gifted youngsters in Japan. However, the mysterious disappearance of his mother during grade two would forever affect young Kenji, to the point of him dropping out in high school school. One may speculate some of the disturbing plot twists and things that have to do with your mother in D may have something to do with this disappearance of his mom at a young age. The circumstances of this event are so mysterious and obscure. I've done hours and hours of research online and I've only seen small mentions of this. I can't find police reports. I've uh, translated interviews. I read the whole one-up interview with Kenji Ino. I can't find anything more than it mentioning that his mom disappeared. Nothing to do with the circumstance, nothing about why. If any of my viewers out there have some more information about uh, Kenji Ino's mother's disappearance, I'd love to hear your take, or I'd love to hear what evidence you have, or you know, more to the story. It, it really interests me. After Mr. Eno dropped out of high school, he had several different jobs that weren't game related, but he went on to make video games for the Famicom, which was the Nintendo Entertainment System of Japan. He also wrote the scores for several games. However, Mr. Eno had some problems. I don't know why, it could have something to do with his mother's disappearance. You could really tell in his game, this guy was a genius, but he was a little crazy. He ended up retiring in the late 80s from making Nintendo games from some self-professed mental instability. He said, you know, he was at a time in his life where mentally he didn't feel stable. Being out of the game industry for a while, uh, Kenji did some other odd uh, jobs back and forth here and there. However, in 1994, he was able to attend Macworld in San Francisco, California. Now, there's an old counterculture event that's been taking place in San Francisco since the days of the hippie in the 60s. It was called the Human Be In event. Now, this event, among other things, included the advocation of mind-altering substances and other means of reaching a higher consciousness. Now, the event was long gone. However, it did have a spiritual successor, kind of tacked onto the 
the end of Macworld, it was called the Digital BN event. And this event did carry over a lot of the same uh, mind altering substances, but this time, I mean, they had huge sponsors. They had Microsoft, they had Apple, they had all the big guys that it was basically an after party for Macworld. Now, this was Kenji's first time kind of exploring back into the digital realm. He, he wasn't quite sure he wanted to get back into video games at this point, but a friend had brought him to Macworld, and after the show, he told him, you know, let's go over to the digital BN event. Kenji stated about his experience. Then we went to this counterculture event known as a BN. It was a dark, twisted version of Macworld. But here the creators were all high on drugs. <laughs> They were selling badges and showcasing their music and stuff like that, besides showing their games, and this really shocked me. And it made me think that, okay, game creators can be cool. It's not just nerds out there. They're actually cool creators. Kenji discovered some startups and some investors who were interested in his work. So after making his connections at Macworld, Kenji went on to establish his most famous endeavor, which was the company called Warp. Now, as we all know, if you guys have been watching my videos, Warp went on to create the game known as D. What time will my daughter be home? The passive type probably plays Nintendo. What time will my daughter be home? Somewhere between 10 and 2. The aggressive type probably plays Sega. What time will my daughter be home? You want her back? And the other type definitely plays 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. Unfortunately, Kenji chose the ill-fated, overpriced, and not even available in some markets, like where I'm from, Utah, we didn't even have this system. He chose the 3DO to be the console that would play his games. He stated the reason he went with 3DO is because at the time to develop for Nintendo, they were still cartridge based, whereas the 3DO had moved on to a CD based medium. Nintendo required a major upfront sum, somewhere around 10 US dollars a cartridge produced. And he just, at that point, he couldn't afford it even with the investors that he had obtained over at Macworld. Kenji stated, I didn't have the finances to create a game on Nintendo. That was one factor. But also, 3DO was a very good company. And 3DO was a San Francisco based company. Since I was influenced a lot by the BN event, which was held in San Francisco too, I wanted to feel the independent creator culture from San Francisco. As the game development for D wrapped up, here's where the situation gets interesting. How do you get all that wanton and gratuitous violence, gore, cannibalism, you know, in 1994 especially, how did he get that into the final project? Well, I'm gonna let Kenji tell you that from his own mouth in an interview that he had when whatup.com just a few years before his untimely death. Kenji Eno you know, stated, There's a crazy story behind this. When I was first making D, it had no story. The game was already almost completed, so to put a story in the game, I had to insert it as flashbacks. I wanted to do some kind of a trick. Back in those days, you weren't allowed to make any violent games, like stabbing people inside of games, that was taboo. So so you weren't allowed to do that. D has cannibalism, which was a total taboo back in the day. But I wanted to put this in the game. So what I did was I didn't show anyone else in the company those scenes. I was hiding them until the very end. You submit the master and they check the master and approve the master and put a sticker on it. This gets sent to the US to get printed. There was a penalty you had to pay if you were late in submitting the master. But you'd also have to deliver it by hand. So knowing this, I submitted it late on purpose. I submitted a clean one and got it approved. Then I had to bring it to America. So on the plane, I switched the disc and submitted it to 3DO and it got manufactured like that. Now, Kenji was a crazy personality in and outside of the video game industry. D ended up being ported over to both the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation. When it was ported over to the Sony PlayStation, it was found out by Kenji that Sony ended up vastly unproducing the discs. So even for the pre-orders that came in for D, they didn't have enough to fill the demand. When Kenji went to the Sony offices to complain about this, one of the executives at Sony assured him, yes, there will be enough supply to meet the demand. Kenji didn't believe it. Kenji said, so I was talking to a guy at Sony 
and this, this was toward the end of the year, and I said, okay, I'm gonna go to Japanese electronic retailer Bic Camera, and if I don't see my game in there, I'm gonna punch you. And they said to me, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's gonna be there, it's gonna be there. And I went to Bic Camera, and I didn't find it. So I actually, I did, I, I punched this guy. So that should tell you how mad I was. Interesting, interesting. I was originally creating real sound for Sony because originally I like Sony. All the electronics in my house were Sony branded. That's the irony. Now, Kenji went on to make other video games and he worked in even more industries. He worked in the camera industry, the gambling industry. He did some things with tobacco. He kept making scores throughout his life. One of the more notable games that he made was a game called Real Sound. He developed this game for the blind. Because it had no visuals and you played the entire video game just using your ears and buttons. This was a Japan exclusive. He did some other crazy marketing techniques like, like releasing a game with a condom attached. One of the interviewers at OneUp.com made a funny mention that whenever you find that game in Japan, the condom is still intact and not used. He asked, you know, what do you think that says about gamers? <laughs> he also released a few games that were packaged with seeds. Yes, like seeds you could grow plants with. One of the most notable things, one of the things that I find super interesting is he did release his follow-up to D on the Sega Saturn, which was called Enemy Zero. And when he released it, originally it was supposed to be for PlayStation. However, in a conference in Japan, they came up to announce the game and it showed the PlayStation logo up on the screen. As he came up to announce it, it morphed into the Sega Saturn logo. Basically saying, F you Sony, you guys unproduced my last game, I'm going just Sega from now on. Which essentially kind of sealed his company's fate because the next two Sega consoles were not a success. But the cool thing he did with Enemy Zero is he released a special edition. Yeah, he released 20 special editions of Enemy Zero. You had to spend 2,000 US dollars and it was only available in Japan. If you bought the special edition, Kenji would get in the company van and he would actually hand deliver that copy of Enemy Zero to your house. He did say when he made this, he was kind of afraid that maybe somebody on some of the outlying islands of Japan might order one. But thankfully, most of them were very close and he was able to just drive and deliver those, have a quick chat with the gamers and go on to the next. Now, that's the story of D, Warp, D2, Enemy Zero. Just kind of a little uh, Reader's Digest version.